Let's turn in our Bibles this evening to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading in verse 11. We're, we're looking at God's authority tonight, and particularly in the area of the people that God puts over us. 1 Peter chapter 2, and let me start reading in verse 11 and on, on down to verse 20. <clears throat> Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, for unto governors is unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. We just stop reading there. I just remembered I had some, uh, some things to, to pass out. Maybe, uh, Raymond, maybe you could help me with that. And uh, Brad, to... Uh, I think there's enough there for just about everybody. We're looking at what you might call God's chain of command. Uh, you know, God is the ultimate authority. God is an authority over us. Authority is the legal or rightful power. God has the legal and power to tell us what to do. Let me give you a few verses here that will kind of set the, uh, the pattern for us. All the way back, and you can just listen to these or you can, you can look as well. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 39 and 40. It writes through the scripture, of course. Uh, God declares his authority. Deuteronomy 4, verse 39, uh, he says, Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, He is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. Thou shalt keep, therefore, His statutes and His commandments, which I command thee this day. See, God is the authority. God has the right to tell us what to do. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 10, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. And of course, in the, in the Psalms, over and over, he declares uh, God's uh, authority I was looking at several, and there's many that you could look at. For instance, Psalm 93, uh, verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. You know, our God is he's the only God there is. He's the authority. He's the one that's made us. He's the one who's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And, uh, and we've seen, in looking at ourselves, uh, we need to accept uh, God's design. And we talk about self-acceptance. Well, really what we're looking at is accepting God's design for our life. You know, there's some things in your life you didn't get to choose. You didn't get to choose your parents. You didn't get to choose where you were born. 
really, for the most part, you don't get to choose what you look like. And, you know, there's a lot of things. God designed that. And he chose very carefully. And it made you. If you had all the characteristics of somebody else, you'd be somebody else. <laughs> God made you to be you. And, uh, you know, we, we accept God's authority in that. Uh, we thank him uh, for who we are. We should. God has authority. There's a verse in Romans that came to my mind this week where he says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people do that. Uh, they think God made a mistake when he, when he made them. But God didn't make a mistake. God made you just the way that uh, made you. And God has, has authority. He not only has authority, Authority, but God places people in authority over us. You know, that's a little hard to deal with sometimes, but it's true. Uh, as God is the authority, uh, we get power from Him in these different areas. Uh, for instance, God is the one who established government. You know, I think it, it's kind of deceptive sometimes living in a democracy or whatever, whatever it is we live in. Um, you know, we think, oh, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people. That's not really true. Listen, God could remove this government tomorrow and put a new one in. A completely different kind of system because it's of God. The verse I would, I would show you there is Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, the first few verses. There's many, of course, but this is, is one that's very easily understood. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. There's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or, or judgment. And listen to this. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. God is the one who establishes human government. Uh, we need to realize that. And we need to be in submission uh, to God. God is also the one who gives authority in the family. Again, you know, anything that has to do with authority, people don't like it today. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ephesians chapter 6, you know, he says... Um, Children, obey your parents. Now, I was hoping some of our, more of our young people would be here tonight. Uh, they came last week, uh, uh, some of them, and, and I thought, man, this would be a good message for these young folks tonight. A good, good message for all of us. Uh, but God is the one who establishes authority. Uh, unfortunately, many people who should be in authority, because they don't recognize God, won't do what God tells them. A lot of parents aren't parenting anymore. They just want to be friends with all those children that they're procreating or however you say it. Uh, you know, God gives us parents to be parents. And if we'll be the parents we should be, when they're older, we'll, we'll be friends. But uh, Colossians chapter 3, he, he not only talks about the, the family, uh, but some other areas of authority that, that God establishes. Look, look, if you would, there in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 18. Oh, here's the popular subject. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Your God is the one who establishes uh, the leadership in the home. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents, verse 20. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. You know, he, God is the one who gives authority in the home and the, the roles that we're to play. He as well establishes authority in the workplace. Uh, Colossians 3, verse 22. Servants. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. See, God is the ultimate authority. And God puts people in places of authority. And God's purpose is to mold us to the image of Christ. That's what God is doing in, in all of these things. You know, practical faith sees God's hand in the people that he puts over us. There's some amazing examples in the Bible. For instance, Joseph. Remember Joseph? His brothers sold him. All of a sudden, he's a slave. God allowed that in his life. A, a different authority 
God had a purpose in Joseph's life. And of course, with his, you can see the end of it. So, you know, with your life, you don't get to see the end ahead of time. <laughs> and you don't always know what God's doing. But he is doing something. Now, hopefully you won't be into, hopefully your brothers and sisters won't sell you into slavery this week. But hey, if, if they do, <laughs> you know that God has a purpose. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 there, verse 23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there's no respect of persons. God has a purpose. And God has a purpose in the authorities that he allows uh, in our life. Now on that uh, sheet that I've handed out, on the, like, the back, I guess it would be, uh, there's a diagram. Uh, we're like a diamond in the rough. And, you know, God uses authorities to chip off the things that shouldn't be there. I don't know if I've ever seen a diamond in the rough. I've seen pictures. But it's not like, uh, I was going to say, I don't have a diamond, but um, it's not like the diamonds you see at the jewelry store. It's just a rough-looking rock. <laughs> and then they grind it, and they chip it, and they do all kinds of things, and it's, and it's beautiful. And, I mean, diamonds don't have any feelings, but... You know, when you think about us, well, God doing that chipping and that grinding, man, it, it can be pretty painful. And one of the things God uses, one of the main things God uses, is the authorities that he puts in our, in our life. God uses authorities to knock off those, those rough edges. Well, I don't know if you've ever thought about some of the authorities you've had in your life. I've had people share uh, stories. You know, there's people that God puts in our life that mean so much to us. I've had people talk about teachers that, you know, just taught them something or, or put them on a path that, that really helped them. I, I've talked to people 90 years old who talked about their parents and what it meant to them. You know, that authority of, of our parents, it means so much to us. It can mean so much in a positive or a negative way if, if, if it's not a right relationship. Bosses, government, uh, God puts these authorities and they make a difference. And the Bible says, as we read there in Romans, resisting authority is resisting God. And has, he gives us some severe warnings. And when he talks there in, in Romans chapter 13, that's a, that's a portion you need to know where it's found. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And you know, we need to take great care because there, there is a time when we have to say, like the disciples, I have to obey God rather than men. But you know, I've found quite often we can, we can say that when really what we're doing is rebelling. We're, we're not just obeying God. We're just really rebelling against the authority, and we like to make it look spiritual. So be really careful there. Uh, God gives some severe warnings about uh, not following those that he's put in authority over us. There, there are times when we just have to say, well, God's the higher authority. I have to go with him. And then we have to take the consequences. And it can include death in, in some cases. You know, I want to give you some reasons here this evening for uh, submission to authority. It's from 1 Peter chapter 2 there. And the first is for the lost. 1 Peter chapter 2, mainly verse 12, he says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that Whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, people are watching us. Uh, the world is, is looking. They love it when we do the wrong thing. And they know that we do the wrong thing. Uh, we need to remember who we are. The Bible says here in, in, Second Peter chap in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, that we're beloved of God, dearly beloved, he calls us there in, in verse 11. In Ephesians 1, he tells us we're accepted in the beloved. And uh, we should obey just because we have that love relationship with the Lord. You know, Jesus said several times, if you love me, keep my commandments. We need to remember who we are. The lost are watching. They're, they're looking at our relationship with the Lord. You know, I've, I've seen people, Christians, Something happens, and man, they fall apart. You know, the world is watching. We're saying, oh, I'm trusting the Lord, and, and then we don't trust the Lord. 
Uh, we need to, to uh, consider those that are around us. As well, we need to submit to authority and remember who we are because God calls us strangers and pilgrims. Interesting phrase there in verse 11. Strangers and pilgrims. Uh, we're resident aliens is what we are. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the world needs us to be different. They don't need us to be the same as them. If you're drowning, you don't look to somebody else who's drowning. You look to someone who's on solid ground. And you've probably experienced it. When somebody gets in trouble, they look to that person that they might have mocked at other times, but the, the person they know is, has a relationship with God and has some answers uh, to the questions of life. We're strangers and pilgrims. And uh, listen, we are different. Uh, look at ch chapter 2, verse 9. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Yeah, that's who we are. Now, the world has made that strange people. That just means God's own. It means we belong specifically to God. We're His peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. People are watching. that The lost need us to live for Christ. Not only are we beloved of God and strangers and pilgrims, but as well we're soldiers. He talks there about uh, the fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You know, as Christians, we're in a battle. And uh, that's why God gives us the, the Christian armor and, and, and encourages us to, to stand strong. Uh, we're battling uh, the lusts and the, the uh, sin of, of this world. There's a, a war against our soul. We need to remember who we are. But we also need to remember what we are. You know, as Christians, we're, we're witnesses. People are looking at us, and they're seeing uh, what we're like. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, your manner of life. People are looking at how, how we live. And, um, you know, when God speaks to the heart of someone that knows you, Will your testimony be a help or will it be a hindrance? That's what we need to, to keep in mind. Yeah, I've, I've met people who said, you know, I know so-and-so and I want the God they have. But, you know, I've known the other as well. I know so-and-so and I don't want to be like them. <laughs> you know, someone who says they're a Christian and, but doesn't live like one. Uh, we need to remember, we're witnesses. He, he uses that ex that idea in, in 1 Peter 3, verse 1, when he talks to the wives, wives, Christian wives of lost husbands. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Be in subjection to your, to your own husbands. You know, our neighbors, our fellow workers, our schoolmates, uh, they're watching. And uh, we need to be in submission to authority, particularly God's authority, but then also the authorities that God puts over us uh, for the sake of the lost. Secondly, we need to be in submission to authority for the, for the Lord's sake. D did you notice it there in verse 13? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And then he begins to talk about some of the, of the different ones. Uh, God has a purpose for us. And he, he uses a couple of phrases there in verse 15. He says, he, uh, the phrase I'm looking at here is the will of God. We need to be in submission to authority so that we'll be a part of the will of God. That's what we're looking for. Unfortunately, many times we decide what the will of God is and then tell him that he needs to stamp, we want his stamp of approval for it. Uh, you know, God has a whole lot more resources than you and I do. God has a lot more imagination than we do. And don't just tell him what you want. Ask him. He's the boss. You're looking for the will of God. And then in verse 16, we're the servants of God. And when we're thinking about things for the Lord's sake, uh, we're looking for God's will. We're looking to be his servant. And what he wants is what we should want. And just a, a few points there in, in your notes that I think will help you in this. Uh, one is... Learn to see the difference between a person's position and their personality. You're filling in a couple of, pay, of uh, words there. Learn to see the difference between a person's position and their personality. And when he talks about 
uh, these things. He, he talks about kings and governors and uh, masters and, and so on. Listen, everybody has personality problems. Everybody, you included. <laughs> and if you're the boss, uh, you're, the people working for you are going to have to work around it. Uh, God knows that. God's not surprised when we have our quirks and, and problems. Uh, you know, whatever authority is over you, uh, they're going to have some. They're going to have bad days. They're going to have character problems and so on. Uh, learn to see the difference between a person's position and their personality. Yeah, you can imagine a child saying, well, my parents don't try to understand me, so I'm not going to listen to them. Or, uh, you know, of a policeman, well, that policeman wasn't nice, so I'm going to throw away this ticket. <laughs> you see how far that gets you. Uh, you know, God expects those in, a story, those in authority to have, have problems. And he's able to work through that. Psalm 76, verse 10 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. And we're not excusing it. We're not saying it's right. But we're saying God's not surprised. God knows. And God can use that for good. Uh, see the difference between their position and their personality. Secondly, learn to see the basic intention of those in authority. You'll sometimes get authorities who mean you evil. Uh, you know, there, there is wickedness. But you know, generally, those who are over us have good intentions. You know, they're, they're trying to accomplish something good. I, I know it's popular to make fun of politicians and, and so on, but you know, I can't imagine somebody going through all the hassle of trying to get elected to office who didn't at some point think they could do some good. Uh, you know, God, God uses people. Uh, see the basic intention of those in authority. A good example of that is Daniel. Remember Daniel in the Old Testament? He'd been taken captive along with you know, many of the young men. And uh, they were being told to eat a diet that wasn't what God said they should eat in the Bible, in the Old Testament. But he knew that their intention wasn't to harm them, it was to make them healthy. They were just feeding them the food that they thought was the best for them. And so if you, if you know the story, uh, Daniel approached the, uh, the leader that was, was over them. In fact, let me just, just read it to you here. It's Daniel 1 verses, um, a couple of verses here, 12 and 13. Earlier in verse 8 it says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. As he approached the leader in verse 12, he says, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. And let them give us pulse to eat. Had any pulse lately? My Bible says herbs, I think it's vegetables, and water. Sounds great. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So Daniel was, he wasn't assuming that they were meaning him harm, and he approached it in a, in a logical and, and in a kind way. You know, sometimes when we're, our boss tells us something, or, or somebody in authority, man, we can get so vicious sometimes. And we, we lose our, our testimony. Authorities usually have good intentions. You know, even sometimes when a boss says, listen, I don't want you witnessing on the job. Well, sometimes it's not that they don't want you witnessing. They just don't want to pay for your time while you're witnessing. Uh, you know, if they're saying don't witness at all, that's a different story. But, uh, you know, when someone's paying you to do a job, you don't have the right to just do whatever you want. Uh, you've, you've got to earn your, your keep. And then thirdly, learn to develop creative alternatives. That's what Daniel was doing. He was viewing the, them as God's authority over himself, and he suggested a creative alternative. And he did it with respect. He, he earned their respect by the way he handled it. And you know, God, God blessed them. I heard of a, a student where they were assigned to read a book that they didn't think a Christian should read. And so they went to the teacher and they suggested that the teacher allow them to read three other books instead of that book. You know, that's a, a creative alternative. They weren't trying to get out of work. They just didn't feel like that was something that they should, should participate in. And then, fourthly, develop confidence in God's ability to bring about 
changed decisions. I'm, I'm constantly amazed at how people diminish the power of God. You know, God can change things. <laughs> and uh, we need to, to call upon God and, and trust Him to do that. Develop confidence in God's ability to bring about changed decisions. In uh, Proverbs 16 and verse 7, God says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. In Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1, he says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. You know, there's been many who've experienced where God just turns the decision and changes things. Uh, I heard of a, a young girl who was sneaking off to go to church. She felt like if she asked her mother, her mother would say no. Well, her pastor told her, listen, you need to submit to your, your mother. And uh, so when she asked her mother, can I go to church? Her mother said, no, you go clean your room. And her mother was quite surprised when she cheerfully did and actually cleaned her room. And when she was done, her mom said, well, I guess you can go. And God can change people's decisions. We always think, oh, I'll have, I'll have to work this out. We can get so devious. You know, we know what they're going to say when we don't really. And then we work out how we can get our way. Listen, we want God's way. We want God's will. We need to be in, in submission uh, to those that are over us. You know, even in marriage, sometimes it, for a, a wife to submit to her husband uh, can be very difficult. But you know, uh, for a wife, your trust is not in your husband, your trust is in the Lord. And uh, we need to understand that uh, we submit uh, to the Lord God. Um, there's great potential in following God's chain of command. God can use that for, for good. God can, can greatly bless. But you know, there's also great danger in violating God's chain of command. And it's quite common for people to pass on their rebellion to their children and grandchildren. And uh, it makes for heartache not only for the individual, but for those in, in their heritage. Uh, many today don't have the home life they'd like because they didn't obey their parents. And now they're passing it on to their children and, and to their grandchildren. It can cause great heartache. Galatians chapter 6 and, and verse 7, he talks about uh, you know, reaping what we, we sow. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And we need to understand that. So we see, first of all, two reasons that we should submit to authority. One, for the sake of the lost. They need to see us as in submission to God's authority. Also, for the Lord's sake. We need to do it just because we, we love the Lord. But then thirdly, he, I think I've read it. Yeah, Romans chapter um, 13 and, and verse 5. He says, No, I didn't read that verse. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. We need to submit to, to authority because if we don't, we're going to get in trouble. That's wrath. But also for conscience' sake. We need to submit to authority just so that we'll be right with the Lord. So that our heart, our conscience, uh, will be right before God. Uh, he mentions this uh, directly and indirectly there in, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 19. This is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Uh, later in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, this is right after the verse where he says, be, be ready always to give an answer. Verse 16, he says, Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. We need to do what's right just for conscience sake. God is working. God is working in every area of our life. And this thing of authority, it's, it's a big part of our life and an, and an important one. You know, the, the first 
thing that we need to submit to is to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Uh, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking all at familiar faces here this evening. I, I hope, uh, I believe that, uh, that's, that that's true. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he, he describes us as a chosen generation. You know, all these expressions, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. In verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Do, do those verses describe you? Have you obtained His mercy? Uh, have you uh, received uh, by faith? the grace and, and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. If so, are you submitting uh, to the Lord and to those that the, that the Lord puts over you? You know, it's not easy sometimes when those in authority uh, give us grief or give us things that we think where they're wrong. I remember meeting a guy, he kept losing jobs because uh, his bosses wouldn't listen to him. And, uh, you know, he, he needed to hear this, this message tonight. Uh, he wasn't the boss, but he, I guess he thought he was. Uh, we need to see what God is doing in our lives and, and allow Him. He knows who's in authority over us. And He knows what, uh, what we need. Are you submitting to those? You know, the Bible uses the expression in, in I think it's in Hebrew, e Ephesians there, as unto the Lord. Uh, here in Peter, in verse 13, he says, uh, For the Lord's sake... In verse 15, we talked about uh, we need to do it for the will of God. In verse 16, uh, as servants of God. In verse 19, for conscience toward God. Now, are we in submission to those that God has put over us? Uh, I hope tonight that uh, this will be a, a blessing to you and that uh, God can use it in some of the frictions of life as you experience uh, those that, that God puts over you. God has a purpose and God has a plan. God can use that in your life. I thought we'd close this evening by singing from uh, our songbook, page 153. It's a song, I Surrender All. I Surrender All. And I'd like to have us think of this both in, in our surrender to the Lord, but in surrender.